Hello, my name is Philip Cardiff and I'm an assistant professor at uh, University College Dublin in Ireland. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about some finite volume methods for solid mechanics and some different solution methodologies for that in open form. Just to give a bit of background and motivation, <coughs> uh, as all of us know, open form is a great tool for CFT, um, but originally it was developed to be a multi physics toolbox um, and that means solving problems like fluid solid interaction and um, so this provides some motivation for looking at finite volume methods for uh, solid mechanics as opposed to the standard finite element methods and also from an academic uh, perspective it's um, it's interesting to examine finite volume methodologies to see if they have any advantages over finite element maybe for example overcoming some problems to do with shear locking and volume locking give some historical perspective, uh, one of the first, if not the first, uh, papers on on the volume method for solid mechanics was by Dimitri et al. in 1988. It was in Croatian. <coughs> uh, it translates as numerical simulation of thermal deformation processes in a welded piece. So it looks at thermal stresses um, due to welding. Uh, the method they describe is 2D structured method. So 2D structure quadrilaterals with small strain and thermal elasticity. And, and then Dimitris and co-workers later went on to extend their method and apply it to a large range of uh, problems. Um, so they extended it uh, a few years later uh, to 3D unstructured polyhedra, similar to the methods used by OpenFOAM. In OpenFOAM, a few years later, there's the seminal uh, paper by Weller et al. Uh, and in this original open form paper, they, they describe the solid displacement from cyber, um, where they perform stress analysis um, of the plate with a hole. So here we've got an analytical solution, and here a numerical solution. And later publications, they, they get a better match. But they, they showed a uh, finite volume method uh, working in open form for stress analysis. Um, subsequently, there's been lots more developments in this area. Um, for example, this is FSI of the Horan Torik uh, benchmark test case, uh, created by Shelko Fukovic. Um, and there are many other developments, uh, including this Extend Bazaar and Sol Mechanics, and then you know, Sol Sofrom toolboxes, amongst others. Um, so there's been uh, people have looked at loss of plasticity, viscoelasticity, multiple materials, fracture, high rates. Etc. Um, when it comes to classifying uh, these different methods, um, kind of volume methods for some mechanics could be classified in a number of different ways. So one could be by grid arrangement. So, for example, in open form, we're familiar with the cell-centered form of the kind of volume method. However, people have also used vertex-centered uh, approaches for uh, kind of volume solid mechanics. And initially, people also use staggered grids. Um, and there have been other methods as well proposed, such as face centered approaches. Another way to classify kind of volume methods for solid mechanics is by solution methodology. So, e.g., we could <coughs> compare implicit versus explicit. So, this is the momentum equation, a uh, generalization of Newton's second law. It says the sum of the forces, or surface forces on the right, equals mass by acceleration. So the surface force could be evaluated at the, the new unknown time instant or the previous time instant. So this would be explicit, whereas this would be implicit. And there's different characteristics uh, of methodologies that use either of these approaches. An alternative, slightly more esoteric approach for classification might be by based on stabilization method. So um, certainly cell-centered kind of volume methods often use stabilization Term or some sort of stabilization approach to, to avoid checkerboarding. Uh, for example, um, to try to illustrate this, if you were to calculate the gradient of pressure by the internal face, one way to do that is to interpolate the gradient from the closest cell centers using some interpolation weight. An alternative method might be to calculate the gradient directly at the face um, by getting the difference in pressure either side divided by the distance. Um, 
if you were to compare both of those methods, um, they would both be second order and they will both approach the correct answer as the mesh is defined. However, the difference between them for a given grid will not be exactly zero. And that difference um, is a type of diffusion, a type of smoothing. So that, in essence, is the so-called reach out smoothing. Um, so if you add that to your conservation equation, you can add a bit of diffusion and, and get rid of the checkerboard. Um, similarly, there's other methods as well. So this is the James and Schmidt Turkel approach, where they add a fourth order um, Laplacian term um, to avoid this checkerboard. But there's other, other methods as well. So um, here in this talk, I'm just going to examine a few different approaches that I've implemented in open form and and just look at their, their characteristics and see how they behave. So I'm going to start from the conservation of linear momentum. Um, once again, the left-hand side is mass acceleration, the right-hand side is sum of surface forces plus sum of the body forces. <coughs> this total derivative on the left we can split by the Ramos transport theorem, um, maybe which is more familiar for people uh, we know CFD, so we have the local derivative, and then we have a convection term. So even though you don't have to do it, um, it's typically more convenient in solid mechanics to take a Lagrangian approach. So for a Lagrangian approach, we're going to move the mesh at the same velocity um, as the underlying material. So that means that um, the convection, or the mass leaving each star will be zero. So the convection term will be zero, and that means mass continuity is automatically um, obeyed. So to close our set of equations, we just need to define the stress on the right-hand side in terms of velocity or displacement or incremental displacement or something like that. In uh, solid mechanics in general, um, if we make no extra assumptions, it will result in a so-called non-linear geometry formulation, either in total Lagrangian or table Lagrangian. I'm not going to go into the details of these, but these are also known as large strain formulations. If we assume that the displacements are quite small, um, and by displacements being quite small, I mean the changes in the volumes and areas of the cells is negligible, then we can adopt this linear geometry approach. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to focus on the linear geometry approach. So let me rewrite velocity as a derivative of displacement. So now I have a second derivative of displacement on the left, the mass by acceleration. And now I will take one of the most common definitions of stress, um, Hooke's law. Um, so I'll sub that in, in terms of displacement. So now I have a vector equation with three unknowns, which are the three components of displacement. So now this equation can be solved for u here, which is displacement. Uh, just be careful, u here is displacement, even though I know in open form, u is often used for velocity. But I'm using v here for, for velocity, as is standard in some mechanics. So I'm going to, um, in particular, look at three different solution methodologies here. Uh, one is an implicit method, <coughs> which is segregated. It's implicit and block coupled. Uh, the final one is explicit. So, um, the implicit uh, method is implicit in time. So both implicit methods um, require the solution of some system of linear equations. So in essence, inverting some matrix, whereas the explicit method is matrix free. However, the explicit method requires that the current number is less than one, actually probably less than 0.5, whereas the implicit methods are unconditionally stable, so they will work for any time step. Um, there's a lot of choices I could make to make uh, a variety of these different approaches. Um, but the form I've taken here is I'm assuming we're solving for total displacement in all of them. Um, in the segregated approach, um, I'm assuming the gradients are interpolated from the side centers to the faces, whereas in the block coupled, I'm going to calculate the gradients directly to the faces. I, um, I could do either. Um, and for stabilization, we can use reach hour or GST. Um, and for the block coupled, as I'm calculating the, um, 
integrate instructed faces, I won't use unstabilization. Um, and then for the explicit, um, I'm doing something similar. So if we look at the implicit first. If we were to um, take a naive approach, you'd say, well, the open form has an implicit Laplacian, but it doesn't have an implicit Ds of grad G transpose or Ds of trace. So uh, naively, you might implement something like this. Um, so this actually will work and it will converge. However, you will require uh, under relaxation for your displacement field. Um, this is something similar to solid displacement form. But actually, what solid displacement form does, based on this Yasek and Weller over relax approach with the reference given below here, um, is they boost this Laplacian term. Um, the motivation for that is that the divergence of gradient gravity transpose is kind of similar to a Laplacian. So that means you can approximate the implicitly as Laplacian, and the same goes for the divergence of a trace of gravity. So that's where the extra mu and lambda come from. So then they explicitly take away the difference. So when this uh, loop converges, you get displacement field which satisfies the original gradient. Although it's not um, discussed in detail in that paper, in fact they are using a form of Riccio smoothing, where they take the difference between the Vlasin and the divergence of gradient uh, of Gradu, um, and that's added to the one dimensional equation as a force, basically, um, which tries to smooth out uh, checkerboard. Alternatively, you could use something like uh, James and Schmidt Turtle, which is a uh, Laplacian of a Laplacian, um, and one form might look something like that. That would do something similar. If you look at the block couple approach, um, in that case we would just write um, each of the three terms of the divergence stress fully implicitly um, using a discretization like this. Um, so uh, this is described in this tape, tape over here. So this would be, it doesn't require a loop on the outside, it's just fully implicit. We solve it once, and since the equation is linear, we, we don't need to do equations. And the last one, the explicit. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, this is just one simple way to do it. This is a velocity, so I'll just say at the next time step, velocity is dot velocity plus the time step, or the old acceleration, the new, new displacement is the old displacement plus the time step, or the new velocity. We then enforce our boundary conditions on the displacement field. Then we update our stress at the side centers. We calculate our stabilization. In this case, I'm using GSD. Maybe you could use the Jow. And then we update our new acceleration. Um, so this is just a momentum equation here, where I just divide the last by uh, density. And then that's the end of the time step. So pretty straightforward to implement this. OK, let's look at some example cases. So I've taken a relatively simple one, uh, the one that we looked at in the original open form paper, just plate hole, so plate with a hole in it. Taken a kind of simplified version where you just have a traction of one megapascal applied to the right, synergy name, symmetry name, no traction here, and no traction here. So these are three surfaces here. I increased the density of the mesh just to have a much finer mesh, so I have 100,000 cells. And I'm going to take two particular forms of the case. One is going to be steady state, one time step with no natural effects. I'm going to look at the two implicit approaches to segregate and couple to see everything there. And then I'm going to, uh, in the second case, uh, look at a transient form where I change the end time to 0 0.01 seconds um, with this time step, a small time step. And I'm going to compare the explicit and implicit approaches. Also, I'm, I'm going to compare the implicit and segregated approach using a, a larger time step as well. So, this is the hydrostatic stress. So, we see in our um, the material has been squashed here and it's been pulled there, which makes sense. I've uh, increased the deformation by a factor of 100,000 just so you can see the shape of the plate because the deformation is quite small, so not too exciting. Uh, but at this measure, uh, mesh resolution, the implicit methods will all give the same answer. You won't see the difference between them. Uh, for coarse measures, you might see one is a little more accurate, um, but I won't discuss that now. But if I just compare the this number of iterations and the speed, if you look at the implicit segregated, took 187 seconds, whereas the coupled was much faster, 23 seconds for this 2D case. Uh, the coupled doesn't do any iterations, um, uh, the 
capable of finding each of the negative 226 iterations. And in this case, for the couple, I use a direct solver, which might explain why it's much faster. So for small systems, you can use something like Gaussian elimination or um, LED decomposition to solve the system, which makes it much faster. For the transient case, you apply the stress um, at the first time instant, and this causes a pressure wave to travel uh, across our domain at the speed of sound. So just to visualize this, I've warped the, um, the plate geometry in the vertical uh, z direction um, by a certain scale factor by the pressure field, just so you can uh, visualize what's going on. So you can see there's this negative pressure as we pull it back. Um, and as the wave hits the free surfaces, then you get a tensile wave propagated back. And also, you can see these small little oscillations here. So this is the ex solution from the explicit solver. So if I compare that solution of the explicit with the implicit, um, you'll get very similar answers. Um, however, you'll notice that the explicit has these um, oscillations at the front of the wave, where the shocks are, you have these extra oscillations. Whereas the implicit doesn't have any of these oscillations. In fact, it has a much smoother front. So that's the implicit segregated. If I look at the implicit segregated, we're at a much larger time step. It's still stable, of course, but it has even more smoothing. So a huge amount of diffuse smoothing. If I plot uh, along a line here, I look at that in time. And I compare the explicit in red and implicit in blue for the same time steps, which is the current number of 0.5, and the implicit with a 10 times larger time step. You see these oscillations much clearer in the explicit scheme, whereas the implicit scheme is, is much uh, smoother. So this is a classic implicit versus explicit. Explicit has these dispersive errors, and uh, implicit has these diffusive errors. So implicit tends to remove energy, whereas the explicit tends to create energy. So there's lots of different variants and schemes and things we could do to try and make that better, but um, this is as is using our kind of simple implementation. And if you look at the time it took, the explicit um, versus the implicit with the same time step, the explicit was faster, um, which makes sense because it didn't need to make a matrix. However, because the implicit is kind of iterative and it's kind of semi-explicit anyway, it wasn't that much slower. If we increase the time step, okay, our answers get worse, but of course it kind of gets much faster to increase it. Um, but if we use the couple solver, and in this case we don't use the direct solver, we use an iterative solver for the Uno system, so the couple solver is, is much, much slower because it's quite expensive to make this full, full matrix every time. So you can see there's a, a tool for, for each purpose. So if we have these high rate problems, then maybe this full plot couple approach doesn't really make sense. Okay, so that's just a small look into some of the some different kind of soil mechanics solution methodologies. There's lots more. Uh, but hopefully you'll have a little insight into the history of kind of soil mechanics and how they're classified with different methods and that there are a variety of different approaches out there. Um, and also, I suppose, just to keep your mind open to the fact that finite element, sure, works great for soil mechanics, but um, there's lots of other methods out there, and kind of volume is one of them that um, maybe has some in uh, interesting things to look at for these problems. Okay, thanks very much for listening.